If you can please take your seats, we'd like to get the program started. My name is James Ennis, and I'm the executive director for Catholic Rural Life, a Catholic nonprofit that focuses its efforts in rural communities around the country. We are based here at the University of St. Thomas and have been in existence for over 90 years promoting and supporting all those in rural communities and applying the Catholic social teaching to the needs in rural communities. I want to thank you on behalf of all our co-hosts who've helped us put together. This is a symposium, a three-day symposium, and this public lecture is just one of many events uh, that have been co-hosted by a number of partners that I'd like to list because they all made this possible. First of all, uh, the Farmers Union Enterprises, which is an organization of five state farmers union, and I like to list those, Minnesota Farmers Union, South Dakota Farmers Union, North Dakota Farmers Union, Wisconsin Farmers Union, and Montana Farmers Union. And the presidents of those farmers unions are here with us today. The symposium was conceived by um, these partners, and the other partners include the Center for Catholic Studies here at the University of St. Thomas that inspired our work with the development of a booklet called The Vocation of the Business Leader in collaboration with the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. Both the Center for Catholic Studies and the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace out of Rome are uh, collaborators in this process. I'd also like to thank the University of St. Thomas and their support of this event and this symposium and this dialogue and bringing together people of many different faiths to address issues in food and agriculture and environment. I'd also like to um, highlight the support from the St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity, that they've been supportive of this effort from the very beginning and have continued to encourage us and support this work, as well as the Minnesota Catholic Conference here, based here in St. Paul, Minnesota, and their good work. I also uh, have, we have some international observers here with the International Catholic Rural Association. And we have observers from Uganda, Africa, the Philippines, Rome, and Italy, and in France. And these observers are keenly aware of these issues and looking to continue symposiums and informing um, this work, which will be, uh, we'll have a co-hosting an international symposium next year on how faith informs future leaders in food and agricultural production and doing it in a responsible, sustainable way that can care for creation as well. And that's why we're here. This is a complex issue. Food is complex. Many of us don't see it day to day. We, we eat our food. We appreciate the food served to us, but maybe have no idea how it's grown, where it was grown, and all that was involved in getting it to our plates. But this gathering tonight will highlight the human, very human aspects of this work and the need to take a look at how we do this work in ways that honor the dignity of the human person and the beauty and the gift that creation is, this earth that we live on. As uh, one of the co-hosts here, uh, Doug Peterson, who's the leader of the Minnesota Farmers Union, I'd like to ask Doug to come up and uh, introduce himself and talk a little bit about why Farmers Union is behind this. Uh, we have 70, over 70 leaders from 14 states here for this symposium, and over half of them are farmers or involved in farm organizations. And frankly, farmers like to solve problems, and that's why we need and want to participate in this symposium that brings together all the best minds and those who are very practical and not keep it too abstract. So I'd like to welcome Doug Peterson, who's been a supporter from the very beginning, and please uh, give him your attention and a warm welcome. Doug. Well, thank you very much, Jim. I appreciate your uh, 
kind introduction and and also uh, I want to thank everybody that's uh, come here tonight and uh, afternoon and participating in this symposium. Um, we have planned for almost a year uh, about a symposium. And uh, but let me tell you before we start that I have to get comfortable with everybody, so I start leaning on things and such. And so be uh, be comfortable with me. Um, the Farmers Union Enterprise states are the core of Farmers Union, and we have our national president here, also Roger Johnson, who is from North Dakota. And uh, we, as the enterprise states, uh, have a tightly held cooperative where we do businesses together, and we have a philosophy of family farms. We have a philosophy of what is right and wrong with farm bills and also farm policy and what happens in rural America and the Midwest and also internationally. We are members of the World Farmers Organization. We are all voting delegates along with the National Farmers Union President Roger Johnson. And we have dialogues with farmers of other countries. The WFO has about 80 members, 80 member countries. And we have symposiums and we talk about the things that challenge farmers, whether it's hunger, whether it's access to credit, whether it's technology, the challenges to women. Women raise half of the world's food on less than five acres. Women. 90% of today's farmers are family farmers. If we gave women access to credit and land title, we would reduce world hunger by 600 million people a year. That's what we talk, that's right. And when we come and talk and, and share ideas with our other uh, farmers from all over the world, the things that this symposium is about will be talked about at there. So the spark for this is not only with the spark for, for the faith leaders and the spark of family farmers, but it is the, far, it is the spark of the humanity of faith and what we do and how we believe and how we have the ability as farm people to go forth every day, every spring, to till, to plant, to harvest, and then try to make a living and make a sense at the end of the year, at the end of the life. Because as we know, all things have their time. So we come together as a farmer's union. We've come together as faith leaders. We've come together as community leaders, environmentalists, and all that. But just one more little piece about farmer's union. We've been involved for a number of years. Uh, if you know anything about the United Nations, if you know or have heard about the FAO, the POW, National Farmers Union in the early 50s was one of the advocacy groups and actually one of the co-founding and urged the United Nations to create a FAO, which deals with food and agriculture throughout the world. That's the mission of this organization. And the mission of this symposium, ladies and gentlemen, is over the next day and a half, we've spent some time today with some pretty good discussions. Um, they're going to be complex. Uh, we are going to get into more of the production and th those types of things tomorrow, bright and early, I understand. Um, but these discussions are not going to be unfamiliar to people. Not unfamiliar to any of us that farm or are leaders or are charged or called to be leaders. And I think that's the important part here. We are all different, but yet, you know, we are all from an agrarian background and we are all farmers at heart. Um, I believe, and there are concerns that are sim similar and in, on direction, uh, and for many of us today, on the direction of farming, and like I said before, and production of food, uh, as to how we and what we want farming and agriculture to look like down the road. I believe uh, I, I learned from uh, Representative Colin Peterson that in the country of Spain, abstract as it is, the country of Spain, five farmers control all of the farming and agriculture in Spain. 
That's something we don't want to see. The charge is to us, and that's the call. So the questions that we're going to take tomorrow and hopefully try answer, we're going to apply the social issues of humanity and faith, frankly. And we're going to seek answers, and we're going to seek suggestions. And yes, we may even have suggestions for change, and then suggestion for change, there is support for change. Because you are leaders. That's why you're here. A couple days ago, I attended a conference, um, Child Hunger and Education. One of the lead speakers drew out and pointed out very, very dramatically that without faith leaders, we could not challenge food insecurity and we could not uh, win the war on hunger. So there is a place in the humanity for food and faith leaders and agricultural environmentalists and organizational leaders to be part of this symposium. None of this works if you farm and you can't make a living. None of it works because my wife, Ellie, and I have to make a living at the end of the day, at the end of the month, at the end of the year. We have to be able to continue. And that challenge is for business leaders and that challenge is for all people because of the complexity of our economies. So with that, and I'll call it salt, we can salt that conversation tomorrow, Bishop. With the issue of staying viable as a business or as a farm and seek those answers. And, you know, those answers are going to be challenging, as I said before. But those answers are going to be considered um, because farmers need to feed people and farmers need to have access to trade. They need to have access to technology. They need to have access to land title, credit and capitalization. So where does the young farmer and the beginning farmer and the exiting farmer fit in all of those questions? And like I said before, yes, the job of making a living from a rural, from making a living from a business profession does really control the direction and some of the decisions and the outcomes that we make every day on the farm or every day with our business or in our parishes or in our congregation, as you know. So for me, this is about finding a path. Finding a path and, and answering the questions. So who do we turn to on these questions? It's very simple. We, we turn to the body of knowledge that is with us that faith brings. It's that simple. The body of knowledge that is within the faith community that surrounds all of these answers to these questions about farming, the environment, business, profit, capitalization, all of the above, everything that I've talked to. And as you know, the answering the issue on food production, and farming is the answer, because if you talk to somebody who's hunger, there's nothing but hunger. There's no answers except I'm hungry, I'm hungry. How do we do that? How do we get there? But farming is really the core to our humanity and it shows up in the parables of all faiths. I think this morning when he, tried, when he started out, we had to separate the wheat from the chaff. I don't know who said that, but we're going to separate, separate the wheat from the chaff in this symposium. I think that's important. And in that separation, we're going to seek the answers, and we're going to carry those answers to our leaders. And that would be the goal. So we are responding to the call to be leaders. We are responding to the call to protect nature, to conserve as faith leaders, to advocate for the, for the being of our humanity, and also as business leaders to protect the economic stability of goods and services and also profit. As I said before, these are core callings. The responsibility today is to each and every one of us and to each other. And this will guide us today, tomorrow, and into the future. 
And in close, I want to leave you with this. We must choose to engage. These are critical issues. Food, faith, farming, and the environment. We must choose to engage. Because if we do not choose to engage, we will surrender our humanity to chance. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't think anybody here wants to surrender to chance. That is not a path that we will walk. So as we conclude this symposium in the next couple of days, I believe the path will be together. And the decisions and the answers will be found together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Now I'd like to introduce you to the president of the Catholic Rural Life Organization, Bishop Paul Aitchen. He's the Bishop of Cheyenne, Wyoming. And Cheyenne and Wyoming has one diocese, so he's actually the Bishop of all Wyoming. But he hails from Indiana originally and uh, graduated from the University of St. Thomas some years back and uh, attended St. John Vianney Seminary here, the minor seminary. And he's been a blessing to our organization. He works with ranchers and farmers out in Wyoming, and so they're also very practical in asking very hard questions. How does faith matter in business? Where, what place does faith take in agriculture? And so it's a real privilege to have him engaged with us, as well as many other faith leaders who are represented here. And I want to thank all those faith leaders in the audience. We have several bishops from Great Falls Billings to the Diocese of Des Moines to uh, Bishop John Anderson from a uh, Lutheran bishop out of Western Minnesota and, and others as well that uh, I don't have time to highlight everyone, but we are grateful for their contribution to this conversation. Because here in this community, we believe that faith does matter. It does have a role to play. It has a role to play in improving the human condition and, and addressing some of these really perplex, perplexing and complex problems. So ladies and gentlemen, just welcome uh, Bishop Paul Aitchen. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here on the campus of the University of St. Thomas again and in O'Shaughnessy Hall. I was uh, telling Bishop Pates, who was my rector in the days I was a seminarian on campus here, I thought when I was a student this facility was a lot bigger than it looked when I walked in this evening. But it's lovely to be here. And I was telling Father Michael Cherney, our guest speaker tonight at dinner, that about 30 years ago in this very hall, there was a cardinal that gave an address by the name of Ratzinger, who later became Pope Benedict XVI. So, tall drink of water there to follow, Father Michael. But I think he's up to the challenge. He's got his own credentials, which I'll share with you here. Father Michael Cherney was born in Czechoslovakia and raised in Montreal, where he attended Loyola High School, evidently was introduced to the Jesuits there, as he entered the Society of Jesus in 1963, the English Canada province, and was ordained a priest in 1973. He did graduate studies at the University of Chicago in an interdisciplinary program in humanities, social thought, and theology, and earned his doctorate in 1978. Father Cherney was the founding director of the Jesuit Center for Social Faith and Justice in Toronto, which sought to implement Catholic social teaching in a variety of domestic and international issues. After the 1989 assassination of the Jesuits at the Central American University in San Salvador, which probably many of you remember, Father Cherney became the director of its Human Rights Institute and the vice rector 
of the Central American University in San Salvador. He contributed there to the UN-mediated negotiations which brought an end to the Civil War in 1991. For 11 years, Father Cherney served as secretary for the social justice or for social justice at the Jesuit General Curia in Rome. He participated in the 1995 34th General Congregation and in a three-man United Nations fact-finding mission in Haiti. From 2002 to 2010, he served as founding director of the African Jesuit AIDS Network, which assists Jesuits in some 30 countries of the continent to respond to the HIV AIDS pandemic in an effective evangelical and coordinated manner. In 2009, Pope Benedict XVI named him as an expert to the Second Synod of Bishops of Africa. And since 2010, he has been serving as an advisor or counselor to the president of the Pontifical Council for, the Just, for Justice and Peace, Cardinal Peter Turkson of Ghana. So it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome at this time, Father Michael Cherney. Dear friends, it's a great pleasure to be here. As you probably know, I'm what I think is called a pinch hitter. Since Cardinal Peter Turkson is, uh, was invited and was very much looking forward to being here this evening, but um, this very week uh, at the Vatican, there's a series of meetings to try to assess and improve uh, our church's response to the uh, crisis of e Ebola in West Africa. And so uh, Cardinal Turkson finally felt uh, that his place was there working with others in the Vatican to assess the situation, to see how well the church has been responding, but then to try to come up with an action plan to strengthen and improve that response. And so I uh, ask you to, uh, in a sense, translate your disappointment at his not coming into support and solidarity with this uh, very important cause and somehow to, to be part of what the church is trying to do to help our uh, vulnerable brothers and sisters in West Africa. So in his place, I'm uh, very happy to accept the invitation and to make this uh, contribution to the symposium and to our thinking about the topic of faith, food, and environment. It's already been mentioned that uh, in the background of our work uh, these days, there is a handbook which uh, maybe some of you have already seen and which uh, we are happy to share which is called the vocation of the business leader. So this is an important stepping stone for the work that we are doing here. Another important uh, stepping stone has to do with the financial crisis, which we're unfortunately still living through. And it, it uh, that crisis uh, gave rise to a booklet that our council published called towards reforming the international financial and monetary systems in the context of global public authority. What that uh, booklet basically did, besides assessing the uh, crisis, was to call for a more uh, proportional exercise of responsibility. Uh, uh, this is something which I think we can apply to our topic here. When a problem is of a uh, universal global size, then the responsibility that we take for it also has to be global. We can't say, well, things will take care of themselves while we kind of do our own thing each in our own corner. And that is something which our world, unfortunately, is not very well equipped to do. So our booklet received uh, a warm welcome from some and uh, quite vigorous criticism from others. And maybe that's a sign that we were on the right track. 
but we think that the problems in our title today of food and agriculture are also global problems and maybe will require global responses. But most recently, just last week, and I think this is a very exciting uh, stepping stone towards this evening, just last week, Cardinal Turkson hosted a major three-day meeting of some 150 grassroots movements. These are movements and organizations of the world's most marginalized peoples, representatives of movements concerned with housing, land, and work. These movements include peasants who lose their land and livelihood to agribusiness, and agricultural workers trapped in poverty, as well as indigenous and other peoples living on the land who are displaced because of industrial or resource developments. Last Tuesday, Pope Francis spent a couple of hours with our meeting in the Old Synod Hall. First, he met uh, selected representatives. Then he delivered an inspiring speech, which has been described as a mini social encyclical. Uh, finally, he met all the participants individually. But before he did that, uh, several of spokespeople were, who had been chosen to share their experiences. And the one that uh, touched, uh, I think, everyone the most was a man who had been working, I think, in Argentina for many years, trying to build up a cooperative. And he started to tell the story of how they had built up the cooperative, and then came to the point where he said that after five or six years of doing fairly well, uh, the cooperative collapsed because one of his colleagues, and this is a quote more or less, sold out to the usual interests who are always in charge. And I think that that uh, note of sad realism uh, also helped us to appreciate what Pope Francis was doing by listening to the people of the grassroots movements. And it's something that we need to take an account into account here too. The topics which we're dealing with here in this symposium and this evening are also very much on the mind of the Holy Father. As has been announced, uh, and you probably know, he plans to issue an encyclical next year on creation or ecology and the environment. And so telling the, all the listeners uh, last week about this, he assured them, and I think he also assures us here this evening, he said, your concerns will be very present in that encyclical. So I think we can all look forward to it with uh, great anticipation and trust that it will provide light and leadership on the thorny issues which we're talking about here. But my task this evening is to give you some first elements of the book, Vocation on the Business Leader, because with this resource, I think that we can think about the agricultural challenges that we face. Uh, I could put it this way. When Cardinal Turkson was invited to this conference, he uh, recognized that while he knew quite a bit about the vocation of the business leader, because this is what we've been working on for the last three years, uh, you're the ones who know about agriculture. So he didn't feel that it was his task to tell you about agriculture. That's what it's your task to tell him and the Holy See about agriculture. Uh, but maybe we can use the framework of the business leader in order to uh, clarify our thinking. And so my first question is, why do we talk about a vocation? Vocation connotes more than work, more than interest and aspiration. It means a real calling. And the Bible has God frequently calling individuals, directly or through dreams or angels or other intermediaries. For instance, David's job was to be a shepherd, but God called him to become king. Jonah ignored God's call because he had no interest in lecturing the people of Nineveh, so God sent a whale to deliver him. 
And when Jesus called Simon Peter and Andrew, telling them, I will make you fishers of men and women, they followed Jesus. But they also continued to fish from time to time. And really, their vocation was distinguished by being of a larger perspective than only fishing for fish. So for the purposes of this symposium, vocation means a calling which comes from God our Creator. Creation and everything created are purposely willed by God. It follows that the meaning of everything that exists is meaningful with reference to God. Accordingly, the sense and value of human activity are not fully discovered without reference to the God of creation. We sell our efforts short when we leave God out of the picture. We do not actually grasp the full meaning of what we do without God's presence. All human activity that affects people, our existence, our world, must be related to God and be seen as a contribution to and a continuation of his work of creation. He who created man and women in the image and likeness of God. Now, Catholic social teaching goes on to explain vocation to be completely authentic as both as individual persons and as social beings. And this, again, is an important feature of our thinking that I think we have tended to see vocation in very individualistic terms. I am called to do this. But I think we are recognizing that our vocation is both personal and social. Vocation is the acknowledgement of an engagement in our whole human existence. And here are a few phrases from Catholic social teaching that you will find interesting when you think of what your own life is or when you think about somebody involved in agriculture. The vocation of every person is to collaborate in God's plan of love in history. God's plan of love in history. I think uh, we were all earlier told that we didn't want to leave things to chance. Well, here we have God's plan, not chance. And it's not a, a harsh plan, but it's a plan of love in history. Another phrase, the revelation in Christ of the mystery of God as love is at the same time the revelation of the human vocation to love. This revelation sheds light on every aspect of the personal dignity and freedom of men and women and on the depths of their social nature. We are made to love because God is love, but our love is not restricted. It's expansive. It's inclusive. It reaches out. Only in relationship with God can men and women discover and fulfill the authentic and complete meaning of their personal and social lives. And finally, and this is very important for agriculture and for all of our activities, work has all the dignity of being a context in which the person's natural and supernatural vocation must find fulfillment. Work is not a distraction from our vocation. Our work is where we work out our vocation. Pope Francis has uh, taken this thinking a bit further in uh, Evangelii Gaudi. He says that the essential vocation and mission of God's people, of all of us here, is to strive so that earthly realities and all human activity may be transformed by the gospel. And then he singles out the worlds of politics and business and he wrote subsequently to the World Economic Forum last year, business, and now here you can begin to apply business to agriculture, business is in fact a vocation and a noble vocation, provided that those engaged in it see themselves challenged by a greater meaning in life. Again, the need to see things broadly, finally to see things in the light of God, if we're going to see them for what they really are and for what they can be. Otherwise, we sell our vocation short. Uh, 
Businessmen and women are able to serve more effectively the common good and to make the goods of this world more accessible to all. So business belongs to such a human activity and, and entrepreneurs or business people should see themselves as called by God to exercise their necessary and important skills and activities in order to assist God in continuing his work of creation. God didn't create and walk away and leave it to us. God's work of creation continues, but now relies on us to help carry out his creative love for us. Properly understood, business leadership is indeed a calling, a vocation, a very noble role. And so we could conclude about business life, the church takes great joy in supporting and helping business people to respond appropriately to their vocation and to find the place of their activities in God's design for humankind and for our world. And so now I'd like to translate this same sentence into our topic. The church takes great joy in supporting and helping everyone in agriculture to respond appropriately to their vocation and to find the place of their activities in God's design for humankind and for our world. So what could be the meaning of a vocation to agriculture? Agriculture is a constant backdrop in the Bible. The language of Jesus is full of illustrations from agriculture, tending flocks, planting, harvesting, managing agriculture with granaries and with payments to workers. Jesus assumes that his listeners understand and respect healthy agriculture. This allows him to make comparisons to agriculture in his parables. For instance, in the parable of the good seed, how seed reacts to different types of soil helps Jesus to teach what happens when people react in different ways to the word of God. So this enriches our thinking as we turn to agriculture as a vocation. From the very beginning, the Creator asks us to till the earth and to keep it. To till and to keep. I think that this is a wonderful mission that we have received, all of us, but in a special way those in agriculture, to, to till and to keep. That doesn't mean to keep in such a way that you can't till. In other words, not just conserving. On the other hand, it doesn't mean to till as if there was no tomorrow. It means to till in a way that is also keeping, conserving, preserving. It is part of our assignment as human beings. It cannot be just a job if we treat it as part of God's plan of love in history. Putting this sense of vocation positively allows me to suggest that agriculture is a vocation when we carry it out within God's plan of love in history and when it is the occasion for us to discover and fulfill the authentic and complete meaning of our personal and social lives. So how can we elaborate this grand vision of agriculture as a vocation? And as I said, I will uh, review with you the business leader in order for us to see how this could happen. The, the, the project began two and a half years ago. The, our, the stimulus was the uh, last uh, encyclical of Pope Benedict XVI, Caritas in Veritate. And after that, the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace collaborated in two very interesting conferences asking how this encyclical could be applied in real life. And the outcome was the decision to write a handbook for businessmen and businesswomen that translates the specific principles of Catholic social teaching into practical ethic, ethical guidelines for making decisions. It is to provide guidelines for making decisions. It is not telling you what is the right decision. It is helping you to reach the right decision. But it is recognizing that sometimes reaching the right decision is a very, very tough challenge indeed. 
The work was, was done by an international group of about 15 business people, managers, researchers, and educators, and the coordinator was your own professor, Michael Naughton, whom I trust all of you know, and the working group also included the president of the International Christian Union of Business Executives, which is called UNIAPAC. And we're very grateful to them and to all those who participated. And we can anticipate that the vocation of the agricultural leader will also be produced by a fine international working group. The handbook appeared in its first edition in French and English in early 2012. It is now being used in a, uh, in a growing list of languages. 15 translations have been completed and at least two more are underway. It is being used in university courses, in discussion groups. It has stimulated research. There's even a, 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 a blog which is treating every section. There are 80 uh, paragraphs in the booklet and the blog is treating them one, one at a time to explain how this can be applied in real life. The vocation of the business leader begins with what is called the logic of gift. And the logic of gift is something uh, contributed by Pope Benedict that is really beautiful to understand, but uh, challenging at the same time. Every Christian is called to practice charity and truth in a manner corresponding to his or her vocation and according to the degree of influence he or she wields in the public sphere. Charity, in other words, is not a choice. It's not something I do uh, kind of as an extra. It's really part of who I am and what I'm called to be. And the kind of charity that I exercise has to do with my place in life, my place in society. It's a, it, it, it has to do also with my responsibility. And therefore, and this is the second point, the principle of gift, of generosity or gratuitousness must find their place within normal economic activity and commercial relationships. And this is the challenging part because you don't normally think of generosity or gift as part of normal business life. And yet, if business life is going to reach its full human potential, it has to include gift, generosity, gratuity. And we'll see, I think, something similar in agriculture. Our very lives and the entire world we inhabit are gifts freely given by God. And this gift should inform how we act in our business endeavors. It humanizes and civilizes business, where business people see themselves as stewards rather than owners, their wealth as common rather than just private goods, and their employees as persons rather than only as instruments of production. And the booklet points to this right at the very beginning. It says, in the gospel, Jesus tells us, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. This, you can see, applies to business people who have been given great, great resources and the Lord asks them to do great things. But this will also apply to people in agriculture to whom much has been given and from whom much will be demanded. And that's what we're waiting and expecting to see from them in their vocation. The gifted character of business carries social implications. Business leaders have significant means to undertake something, and with this comes a corresponding responsibility. You might say, well, the responsibility of business is not to lie and not to cheat. That, that, that's ethics. But that's not enough. Vocation, to see business as a vocation, makes an ir irreplaceable contribution to the material and even spiritual well-being of humankind. That's much more than just avoiding lying and cheating. It is about a meaningful life that opens the business person to God's will, and not simply to their own will. 
in the day-to-day -day decisions of ordinary life and which gives us the capacity to share goods in common and to build community. This vision of business is grounded in what we call Catholic social teaching. At its center is the fundamental dignity of all human beings because we are made in the image and likeness of God. This expresses God's infinite love for us. Faith does not accept that a loving God would wish untruth or bondage or injustice or strife for us. God does not want us to be unhappy. God does not want us to be in conflict. Rather, based on divine love and human dignity, our faith compels us to embrace four fundamental values, truth, freedom, justice, and peace. This is, these are what we really want, and these are what we really want to work for. Because they are grounded in our divinely and lovingly created human nature, we have an absolutely firm response when such values are challenged or denied. So if you pause again for a moment and think of our fundamental dignity as human beings and how we express this in our daily lives, uh, you can see the, the challenge now of understanding this in terms of agriculture, food production, and caring for the environment. Catholic social doctrine enunciates many other principles, some of which are particularly pertinent to the world of business. Service to the common good comes before serving narrower interests. The goods or resources of the world have a universal destiny. Creation is a gift to the whole of humanity, not just to a part. We are called to act in solidarity with those who lack access to these goods with the large portion of humanity who suffer in the midst of plenty. So you see how each of these ideas, which, is, which are richly developed in our tradition, become a question for us when we look at a vocation like the agricultural one. What is human dignity in agriculture? What is the place, the, uh, the scope of the common good? What does it mean to say that Creation was made for everyone and not just for some. What does solidarity mean? These truths, these principles become questions which open up our thinking so that we can think about agriculture, food production, food distribution, uh, environmental issues in a deeper, more human, and finally more divine way. This vision of business, which it takes these values so seriously, is not without significant tensions. It doesn't make it easier. It just makes it much more meaningful and finally much more satisfying. And such business is not easy to execute in today's world. And I'm sure that as you're listening to me, you're saying he's a lovely idealist, but imagine in reality what it would mean. But that's what I'm going to ask you. What in reality would it mean? Business leaders experience great pressures, excessive competition, the demands for efficiency and profitability, and even the basic, the basic uh, requirement mentioned earlier that we have to survive, we, we have to make a living, we have to be able to continue uh, year after year, uh, that's, uh, that's true, uh, absolutely undeniable. But how we do it and what we consider to be appropriate, or as we say, when is enough enough, uh, those are still questions that we need flexibly to reflect on. Many external obstacles can also affect a business leader's decisions. And here you can think both of local or international situations, like the absence of the rule of law or regulations, corruption, tendencies towards greed, or poor stewardship of resources. And among all these difficulties, there's one which uh, touches us very personally, and that is what we call, and what the church in her teaching calls, a divided life. 
a divided life, a life which finally means that we are Christians on Sunday, but we're just ordinary folk from Monday to Friday, that we know and appreciate living our faith in a church way, but we don't know how to live our faith in our daily lives, in our weekly activities. And this uh, divided life is probably uh, uh, one of the big obstacles, one of the big challenges that we face as believers. How do we bring our faith authentically into our daily activities, into the, joy, into the choices that we need to make on a daily basis? The split between religious faith and day-to-day -day business practice can lead to imbalances and misplaced devotion to economic success. In other words, that we can carry out our business as if we were not Christians, because somehow our Christian life is limited to Sunday, or it's limited to uh, family life, or other limitations like that. The, the approach that uh, we then take in the vocation of the business leader is to take us through three great steps of uh, reflection, of thinking through what we do. And these three steps are called and you may be familiar with them, seeing, judging, and acting. I, uh, we have uh, prepared these points in my talk, but I think that for the purposes of this evening's discussion, I won't go through these now, but rather leave them open to for our uh, sharing, if our questions and answers, and uh, just bring that, the presentation of the handbook, uh, to an end before making an application to, uh, to agriculture. The handbook ends with six practical principles for business that summarize the discussion of good goods, good work, and good wealth. These are ways of judging the products or the results of what we do. And we could say good production, good work, and good profits. And then, and this is a very significant part of the book at the very end, is a discernment checklist for the business leaders, where all these thoughts and considerations are translated into nearly three dozen questions that a business person could ask, um, let's say once a month, take, a, take an hour off and go through these questions and reflect on what they've actually been doing in their business life. And I'm convinced that if business people would do this, it would significantly change uh, the way they do their business and the, the, finally the satisfaction that they derive from what they do. And I very much hope that the vocation of the agricultural leader will also end with questions like these. As a Christian business leader, am I promoting human dignity and the common good in my sphere of influence? Am I supporting the culture of life, justice, international regulations, transparency, civic, environmental, and labor standards in the fight against corruption? Am I promoting the integral development of the person in my workplace? These are questions which, when I ask them just like this, you say, well, they're huge and vague. But if you learn, if we learn to apply them to what we actually do, they can become very penetrating and very revealing in terms of the choices that we're actually making. But our, the interest that brings us together here this evening is not business in general, but particularly the activity of agriculture. And seeing how the vocation book explores business leadership in general, I really hope that you can begin to glimpse how it could apply to the particular world of food production and marketing, as well as environmental issues. What are the unique features of the vocation of a leader in agriculture? 
As I said at the beginning, neither Cardinal Turkson nor I can give you those answers. Those are for you to work on, beginning in this symposium and later in this, uh, in this project. But I do hope that you will find in the vocation book uh, for business people help in finding the right questions and so the right answers. Thinking about generosity or the logic of gift, it is abundantly clear that agricultural leaders exercise influence over immense and very important resources. The land that feeds us and houses us, the water, the nutritional value of the soil, even the quality of the air at times. Is it legitimate to worry that humanity may now have tilled too much and kept too little? We are mandated to till and to keep, but have we over-tilled and underkept? Can GMOs and chemical fertilizers make their contribution without inhibiting the preservation and continued spontaneous growth of God's creation the original gift of all? Another difficult and open question. How do agricultural leaders react to the central ideas of Catholic social teaching that I mentioned? For instance, is common good subordinated to the ability to pay? Does subsidiarity influence the willingness of powerful corporations to allow and even assist other farming structures like family farming in sub, some regions, peasant farming or subsistence farming in others, to flourish alongside of agribusiness? Is, does agribusiness leave room for others or does it have to be the only show in town? When it comes to seeing, remember I said seeing, judging and acting. When it comes to seeing, we can ask about the influence of globalization and financialization on agricultural planning. Do those plans reflect the goal of adequate nutrition everywhere, or do financial considerations push thoughts of food aside? One of the difficult cases is the reduction of capacity for local food production, so as to grow ethanol-producing crops for distant customers, a clear case of the impact of living in a global economy. And maybe we, there are even experiences of that nearby here. Certainly in other countries, the growth of uh, ethanol crops has made a big difference in terms of people's ability to survive and to uh, feed themselves. When agricultural leaders judge about good goods, do they think about what sells or do they focus on truly feeding a hungry world while stewarding the environment in a responsible and prudent manner? Do the production and distribu distribution decisions address the rampant problems of malnutrition? And are long-term risks, such as the growth of resistance to herbicides and pesticides, included in how they assess technological innovations? In the same way, thinking about good work, are migrant workers treated with human dignity and with fairness? Do policies and subsidies favor some forms of agricultural business over others without a compelling rationale in terms of human and environmental benefit? The heading of good wealth is especially pertinent. Do agricultural leaders see themselves as stewards of the earth? Do global markets accept the food sovereignty of every country and region? Is wealth generated by agricultural business distributed and used to preserve nature and provide food for future generations. Finally, I have one suggestion with regard to the acting of agricultural leaders. Before you sign off on an order, can you ask, is this what is best for humanity and for the environment? Is this that I'm now doing best for humanity and for the environment? And realize that best is not a synonym of most. The most fertilizer may not be what is best. The most profit may not be what is best. Any more than eating the most is necessarily the best for one's health. 
Instead of the, the most, we must always try to do what is optimal. This may be neither the minimum nor the maximum. For example, maximum yield in crops and in investments is a worthy objective only if it is an optimal strategy for human and environmental outcomes. This may sound abstract, but it actually touches on one of the very basic issues that we are facing and that we already heard about uh, today in an earlier talk. And that is the question of feeding the extra 2 billion people who will be joining us on the planet in the coming decades. Uh, there are many people who believe that the only way to feed more people is to produce more food. And producing more food will have the proportionate costs that uh, we already see in the environment. But if you notice that we are producing in more than enough to feed everyone and that we're throwing away 40% of what we produce, then maybe we need to pause and ask what is optimal? Is it optimal to, to increase the amount of production by 20% and continue to throw away 40%? Maybe not. With these thoughts, I bring us to uh, the topic which is, I think, already in the title of the symposium, uh, and that is the notion of human ecology. And so let me end with some thoughts on human ecology, because we want to have an ecology which is inclusive and comprehensive and not narrow. Surely our human bond with the earth is absolutely foundational. In Genesis, the, the name Adam comes from Adama or ground or earth. So too, the word human is grounded in the word humus, which means soil. Humanity was not created out of nothing. Humanity was created out of Adama or out of the ground, out of the earth and out of humus. So without earth, there is no human being. God could have made more angels, but without the earth, he couldn't have made us. Moreover, moreover, our human story begins in a garden, not in the wilds. And it involves more than the laws of nature. Humanity is the factor that opens the earth up to new possibilities and new realizations. Are they new harmonies or new imbalances? The outcome depends on our actions. We are in that intimate a relationship with the earth. When we care for the earth or misuse it, we care for ourselves or abuse ourselves. Because we are for earth and we send forth as gardeners, our nature is to consciously work the soil, work on and within the ground from which God made us. So we are, we are part of the, the, the earth that we come from and the way in which we live our vocation is also a contribution to the earth. So there are two sides to the idea of human ecology. On the one hand, we know ourselves as God's stewards of the earth. When we exercise stewardship or caring in the style of God, when we act in the name of God the Creator and in His image, we must adopt His style of love and communion. We must imitate God in his way of creating us. Let us seek beauty and harmony in carrying out this role. We cannot divorce ourselves from our instruments so wonderfully fashioned by science, technology, and commerce. If machines and chemicals and investment strategies are hurting nature, we cannot wash our hands. It is we who are introducing them into the garden. Simultaneously, protecting creation means protecting something of which every human being is a part. We are all creatures, we are nature, and we share the destiny of created nature. When we care for the environment, we care for life in general, and so too for human life. And when our interventions in nature lead to changes in nature, these changes do not occur in something distant, something dead, something that is far from us. 
When we make changes in nature, we are changing ourselves too. So the authentic wholeness, the integral self of every man and woman is bound up in whatever we do in our natural environment. So here we have the connection with human ecology. The way men and women treat the environment reflects how we think about and treat ourselves and vice versa. Respect for human ecology lays down the limits and perspectives of development. The environment cannot be considered more important than humanity, nor can the environment be just a warehouse of raw materials. Not to recognize and not to respect our full integral reality is to poison the human environment at the same time as we poison the air and the water. Our faith calls us to this understanding of ourselves and our place in nature. For too long, we have allowed the colossal power of science, engineering, and commerce to separate us from nature and to treat it instrumentally as a means, as a warehouse, as a, as a, dead, a dead reality. So I'm very grateful this evening, and in the name of Cardinal Turkson, I express gratitude for the listening that you have done to this call of faith. With prayer, with loving concern for all humanity, and with the best that science and commerce have to offer, let us roll up our sleeves and return to the garden. Last week, when addressing these grassroots movements, the Holy Father raised the, some of the most difficult questions that we have included in our thinking about agriculture and the future. He mentioned things like land grabbing, deforestation, expropriation of water, inappropriate pesticides, as well as the tragedy of world hunger and the waste of food. When he raised these questions, he then went on to admit that those who were listening to him, and you remember they come from organizations of the most, the poorest and most excluded people, he went on to admit, I know that some of you demand an agrarian reform in order to solve these problems. Agrarian reform. In other words, a whole rethinking and restructuring of the way in which we do agriculture, and the way in which agriculture is based, uh, organized, uh, financed, and so forth. And he, and he added that in some countries, agrarian reform is, besides a political necessity, it is also a moral obligation. And he defended himself because he knew he would be criticized. He said, I'm not saying this for myself. It's in the compendium of the social doctrine of the church. In other words, the, the book that our department published uh, 10 years ago. Agrarian reform is, besides a political necessity, a moral obligation. And so I wanted to conclude with this cry for agrarian reform. Because I ask myself, and I wonder if you would like to debate this true, whether what we eventually will mean by the vocation of the agricultural leader, whether in order to have an agricultural leadership, an agricultural future, would we also agree that we need agrarian reform? In other words, not just people trying harder to do this mission better, but a deeper rethinking of the whole sector. Do we want to consider, whatever it might mean, agrarian reform? And if we think about agrarian reform, would we also think about energy reform? Would we think about sustainable food reform? Would we think about sustainable climate reform? So the vocation of the business leader, the vocation of the agricultural leader, finally brings us to think about our world and about how it is managed and about how we can carry it forward. And it is the role of the church not to provide solutions to these big questions, 
but to make sure that the questions do get asked. And so if we have succeeded in raising these questions with you this evening, uh, then I think uh, Cardinal Turkson and I with him will be very satisfied in having made our contribution, and now we very much look forward to yours. So thank you very much. Father Cherney has uh, volunteered to take a few questions from the audience, and so I thank him for being willing to do that and want to give you an opportunity. Anyone who might have a question or a clarification, um, please raise your hand, and we'll, we have time for a few questions before we close our program for tonight. Thank you for your address. My name is George Booty with Land Stewardship Project. And um, I would tend to support your question, do we need agrarian reform? And to say we probably need it in this country as well. But if that's the case, um, I think one of the questions then is, how do people involved in the various dimensions of this accept that possibility without assuming blame? but to get, get beyond blame and, and say, well, then what can we do together? So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts, comments on that. The, uh, I must say the, the area in which I maybe have thought most about what you're asking has to do with climate change. Um, I think that climate change is what helped me to understand the, the, this last possibility, this need for more like a reform than just a, one new measure or one new agreement. Because it's pretty obvious that on climate change, we really do have to agree together. We can't say, well, that we'll have some, um, we'll have some climate friendly countries and then we'll have others that are less, we can't do that. And yet, uh, in order to get good agreements, we need, we really do need reform, and we need a, a new ways uh, and new depths of ways of coming to decisions, of grasping our responsibilities. That's what we meant with our, the title of our booklet, Financial Crisis in the Light of, of um, let me get the right phrase, in the context of global public authority. How can we exercise authority globally in a way that will get us to where we want to be? I think that's the sense of, of your question. We, it's, you're right. It's not a question of blaming. It's not a question of saying um, this is, although there, there are um, principles which sound a lot like blame, like polluter pays. That, that doesn't sound initially very friendly. And... Uh, People can take it as, um, um, you know, as naming and blaming. Um, there's a way in which there are uh, a billion of us living on a planet way beyond the planet's uh, budget, and the rest are paying the deficit. And uh, I don't know how we're going to sort that out. I think that's where the Holy Father's uh, courageous idea of inviting the poor to speak is very important. Maybe listening to the poor speak will get us off the hooks of the dilemma that you raised. Okay, I think we have time for one more question tonight, this evening. I thank you also. Taking a little different tack than the previous question, um, in the case of both Pope Benedict and now with Pope Francis, when there was uh, more or less direct critique of the direction that modern Western capitalism is taking. They were, they were both roundly condemned for being anti-capitalist and perhaps pro-socialist or even worse in the American press from American um, free market theologians, excuse me, free market economists. Um, <laughs> 
uh, perhaps I'm expressing, you know, we just have come off of uh, a political battle in this country, which is not over, of course. Uh, the church in America, at least, in some parts supports and advocates political leaders who are very much deregulation, pro-development, pro-free trade, no holds barred, while other parts of the church are, are not. How are we going to reconcile that? Uh, I wish I had the authority to ask some of the bishops here to answer that question that way. <laughs> I, I could return to Rome peacefully. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I, I do think that the, the way you've uh, phrased the question points to what one feels watching from the outside, which is that there is a, not so much debate and dialogue as, as polarization, and uh, it's, it isn't easy to transcend it uh, at all, not at all. Um, but I think, that the, um, I think that the only way forward is, to, is, is, in fact, to undertake the dialogue that one believes is part of the solution and to begin and to continue dialoguing and to not to give up on people uh, even when they uh, express uh, very strong and uh, repeated opinions that one doesn't agree with. I don't see any other way forward uh, but that. And um, part of my hope, uh, maybe because I work in justice and peace, is that some of the um, difficult issues, very difficult human issues like migration, or like um, overcoming uh, the trafficking of human beings and the, and the modern slavery, which will be the topic of the Holy Father's message uh, on New Year's this year, that uh, topics like that, not topics, uh, realities like that, uh, do, do draw us out beyond our uh, polarized positions. That we, if, if we can allow ourselves to be touched by people uh, who need us so much, like uh, the undocumented or the uh, other migrants in difficulty, and that maybe in a special way those who have been enslaved and trafficked, um, maybe we can be drawn beyond our polarization. That, that would be my, my hope. Uh, and I would really, uh, with all due respect, I would really say don't abandon your bishops. It's, you know, support the ones whom you uh, really can support. Don't leave them alone. And uh, keep reaching out to the ones who, who, with whom you don't agree. They will probably be, appreciate the chance if they can talk civilly about the things that, uh, the, deep, the deep differences that, that matter to people. I think that's, I know it's no uh, quick or easy solution, but I, I would say that Maybe it's a suitable way to conclude our evening on uh, uh, business leadership uh, that we've already dealt with and on the future of agricultural leadership that um, in, in some senses we have the leaders we deserve and that we are responsible for our leaders. And in that sense that we embrace also, embrace them when they are polarized and and help them to overcome what we see as an obstacle to their leadership. So with that, I hope. Let's give Father Chuni a big hand. Uh, Father Chuni, we as uh, co-hosts have a gift for uh, His Eminence Cardinal Turkson, and there are two prints here on stage. Uh, one is uh, Jesus and the sower and the seed. And these are images from St. John's Abbey. These are prints of a beautiful, beautiful um, Bible, St. John's Bible that has been produced. And so these two, uh, the second one is uh, feeding of the 5,000. And so the image of the sower and the seed, 
And I have a friend who keeps asking me every day, Jim, have you planted any seeds yet? We need to continue to plant seeds to share the wisdom and ideas. And so these two prints are going to be shipped to Rome uh, in, in our, uh, should just show our gratitude for you and for Cardinal Turks and for sharing uh, yourselves and supporting this effort. So we want to thank you publicly for all that you're doing out of Rome for the common good and Thank you again for your wonderful remarks. Thank you.